Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you for granting us uh, journey mercies here. Thank you for bringing us, Lord, so we can study your word. I want to pray that the entrance of your word will bring strength and power, conviction, and real conversion to those who have not been born again, and real holiness and righteousness and sanctification for those who already know you, and for those who are saved and sanctified, that your power of the Holy Ghost will come upon our lives, and Lord, will have the power to be able to do the work you've given us to do. Help us, Lord, as you open our eyes to see what you have for us in your word, that will stand upon this word uncompromisingly in Jesus' name. Thank you, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome you to the Bible study tonight. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And today we're looking at verses 1 through to 6. Look at it from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness, nor of men sought we glory. Neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. As you look at verse 1, there are two words I want you to concentrate on as we begin. In verse 1, it says, For yourselves, brethren, know. The word, brethren, and the word, know. It said, These were people that really knew. And they knew Christ, they knew the gospel. They knew the power of transformation. And they knew what Christ does when he comes into man. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. And this word no, telling us that there were people that had assurance. You'll find in every chapter in this first Thessalonians. Look at chapter 1 verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in what only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye know. You find that word assurance there, in much assurance. They had the gospel. They knew they were sinners. They knew they could not save themselves. And they knew that Jesus Christ came to save them and to turn them away from their sin, to give them new life in Christ. Because of that, they had assurance and conviction. They turned away from their sins and they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. A change came. A transformation came. They became new creatures in Christ. Everything within, without, around, in the home, in the place of work, in the market, in the church, every, everything changed everywhere. And Paul, the apostle, said, you had assurance and you knew. Look at chapter 2. In chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5. In verse 5, neither at any time you swift flattering words as ye know. Again, he emphasized the fact that these were people that were not wishy-washy. They were not people that were thinking, do we know? Do we understand? Are we sure? Are we not sure? He said, as ye know. Verse 11, as ye know. 
how we exalted and, ex and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. They became children of God and they had assurance they were members of the family of God. And in that family of God, they kind of knew the life that a child of God ought to live. In chapter 3, I'm looking at verse 3. Chapter 3, verse 3. For that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we were appointed thereunto. He told them that of course you knew that once you become a child of God and you are cleansed from all the impurities, all the defilements of the world, the people that were still sinful, the people that were still defiled, the people that were still unholy, the people that were still unrighteous, they will hate the people that are righteous. Yea, if any man will live godly in Christ Jesus, he will suffer persecution. And he said, you know, and actually they behaved as if they knew because the persecution, the strife, the contention that came against them, they were able to stand. And so Paul, the apostle, in every chapter of this epistle, he said, you know, you're very sure. There is no doubt in your mind that as you have come to the Lord Jesus Christ, everything it will take the persecution and the pressure, the trial and the trouble and the tribulation. You are ready for that because you know. Look at chapter 4 verse 2. In chapter 4 verse 2 it says in verse 2, For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. They actually knew. Then we're looking at chapter 5 verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. They knew that the Lord was coming. They knew what it will take to make them ready. And so Paul, the apostle said, I'm so happy and joyful. I'm rejoicing because I minister to people like you. You had the word of God. You had assurance. You had conviction. And because of that conviction, that assurance, you turned away from your sin and you turned away from dead idols and you have turned to the true and the living God. And then you rejoice with them and celebrate the assurance that you know. Come back to chapter 2. I'm looking at verse 1 again. For yourselves, brethren, know. Here you called them brethren. Important word. Very significant. That they didn't only know that Paul was a pastor, an apostle, a teacher, an evangelist. They didn't only know that the gospel came unto them. They knew that they came into the family of God. They became a brother, they became a sister, brothers and sisters in the kingdom, in the family. And he said, now you know that you are brethren. What kind of brethren? Because there are many kind of brethren and there are many people running around today and they're saying that we're brothers, we're sisters, we're brethren. What kind of brethren they, were they? Chapter 5, I'm looking at verse 27. Chapter 5, verse 27. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the, what kind of brethren? Holy brethren. You see, these people, the kind of brethren they became, they were faithful brethren, they were holy brethren. Before I talk about holy brethren, let me tell you that in the scriptures and the New Testament, we know, number one, faithful brethren, number two, false brethren. The people that pretended to be the people that were hypocritical. The people that had no relationship with Christ. And yet they associated with the church. The people that didn't have any experience of salvation. The people that didn't have any standing in the kingdom. And yet they professed themselves to be brethren. And Paul the apostle referred to them. He said they are false brethren. Second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 26. Second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 26. In journeys often. In perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in, the, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among what kind of brethren? False brethren. And there's still people like that today in Christendom. People like that today associated with the visible church, associated with the church that we can see. 
and they come on Sunday, they come to Bible study, they come on Thursday, they come to revival, they come to crusades, they come everywhere. Say, so we're brethren, but they are false. How do you know they are false? The Bible tells us and makes us to know how they are false. We're told in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. There were people in those days that congregated and associated, affiliated with the people of God. They came in, but they denied the power, the power of the gospel, the power of salvation, the power that makes sure that when the word of God comes to us, it works in us effectually with transformation, with it turning around, and we live transparent lives, holy lives, and righteous lives, and pure lives. They were not pure. They were not righteous. They were not holy. And yet they said they were brethren. They had a form of godliness. They had the outward shell, the superficiality of Christianity. But they didn't have the real life. It says that they had a form of godliness. They denied the power thereof from such turn away. Look at verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth ever learning. They hear about salvation, they never come into salvation. They hear about repentance, they never repent. And they hear about the judgment day coming. They never set their minds to eat and get ready. And they hear that the power of the cross and the power of the blood of the Lamb can cleanse us and wash us and forgive us and make us totally new. And they never give heed to that. It says they are ever learning. And they never are able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It says in verse 8, now as Janus and Jambres who stood Moses, so these also resist the truth. Anytime the truth of repentance is coming out, they resist it. Anytime the truth of righteousness is coming out, they resist it. Anytime they say truth, the truth of the word of God to be converted, to be born again, to turn around, and to have a new life in Christ. They say, no, I didn't come for that. I just came for religion. They are all for religion. Receive the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the truth. Those were false brethren. And Paul, the apostle, said, you know what? You Thessalonians, I'm rejoicing over you. I'm celebrating your conversion. I'm celebrating your association with Christ, with me, and with the church, because you're for real. Your brethren, your holy brethren, your faithful brethren, you are not false brethren. Look at Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1 verse 16. They profess that they know God. Their testimonies are loud, but they, their character is lousy. It's a lie. They profess that they know God. They can recite some of the doctrines. They can recite some of the salient points of the scripture. They have it in the head and not in the heart. And it says they profess. They testify. They talk aloud. And they tell everybody everywhere, I'm a member of the church. I'm part of the church. I'm one of the brethren. False brethren. They profess that they know God. But in works, they deny him. Being abominable and disobedient and to every good work, reprobate. They're rejected. Come back to First Thessalonians chapter 2. We're looking at verse 1 right there again. First Thessalonians chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 1. For yourselves, brethren, no. Yourselves, brethren, no. What kind of brethren were these? Thank God for them. And I pray that you'll be able to thank God for you. That you are not false, you are not fake, you are not a counterfeit, you are not like a Pharisee, you are not like a Sadducee, born again, saved, turned around, regenerated, recreated, within, without, totally turned around. These were faithful brethren, not false. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 2, Colossians chapter 1. We're looking at verse 2. To the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. To the saints, the lives changed. 
they were not sinners anymore. They were no more secretly committing sins or publicly committing sins. And they were no more rebellious and disobedient against the word of the Lord. Something happened within them. Something happened in their hearts. They turned away from sin. And these were people now that they were saintly. They were righteous. They were pure. They were holy. And then it says they were faithful brethren. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 11, for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. That is Christ who saves and the people who are saved united together, associated together. Christ in them, they in Christ. And those who are sanctified and Christ the sanctifier. They in Christ and Christ in them. They are all of one. And then it says, For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Christ not ashamed to call them brethren. He'll be ashamed to call thieves and idol worshippers and idolaters and adulterers and fornicators and covetous people and smugglers. He'll be ashamed to call them brethren. But for these who are born again, for these who are turned around, for these whose lives have totally become new in Christ, is not ashamed to call them brethren. I pray that God will be able to refer to you as a brother, a sister, in Christ in Jesus name in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 wherefore holy brethren you see how the scripture is very clear it tells us when he's talking about brethren the real ones he's talking about the truthful ones the honest ones the trustworthy ones the ones you can depend upon that these were really saved these were not fervent backsliders. You know, there are false brethren. They are fervent backsliders too. Fervent backsliders are the people. They are rotting within. Their lives are terrible. Their lives are so sinful. But they are very fervent. They are fervent in activity. But then they are not standing in the Lord. These were not false brethren. These were not fervent backsliders. They were holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of your profession, Jesus Christ. Christ or Christ Jesus. We're looking at Romans chapter 8 verse 29. The very reason why you are born again. The very reason why you come to know the Lord. The very reason why you come into the family of God is so that you'll be conformed unto the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be one of the brethren. In Romans chapter 8 I'm reading from verse 29 for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among who? Many brethren. That's what the Lord wants. He wants you to be conformed unto his image, to live a life that like the, that of Christ, to show real conversion and to show real transformation. And with that real conversion, real transformation, he'll be able to say, yes, it's one of my brethren. Saved, separated from the world, turned around, transformed, and transparent, pure, righteous, holy, and following after the Lord, walking in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing to be ashamed of. And nothing to be reproached for because it's born again. Because there is a new life, a renewed life, regenerated life in this individual. I pray we'll all be like that in Jesus' name. As we look at the study today, we're looking at the faithful proclamation of the gospel. What makes people believers? What makes people brethren? What makes people holy brethren? What makes people faithful, brethren, is the word we hear, is the gospel we hear, is the message we hear that comes to us with power, 
that comes to us with pungency, that comes to us with conviction. And then we take that word in and we think on that word, we meditate on that word, we allow that word to affect us and influence us, we allow the word to drive us to our knees, we allow the word to drive us to the cross, we allow the word to bring the blood, dripping blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, flowing from Calvary to come into our heart. We allow that blood to cleanse us and wash us and purge us. We allow the blood to change and transform our lives and then we become brethren. That's the gospel that they heard. And that gospel is the same gospel we're hearing. And I pray that the power of the gospel will walk in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Both old and young. But the old timers and the newcomers, but the newcomers and the people have been there for a long time, that we will be among the brethren of the Lord. A change, a transformation will come upon every life in Jesus' name. That both the speaker, the preacher, and the hearers, the members of the church, will rejoice together in this new life that the Lord had given to his own people. We're looking at the study tonight in three perspectives. Number one, the courage and the suffering of tenacious partners, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. The courage and the suffering that they went through and the sacrifice, the price they paid because they knew that the gospel was true and they knew that Christ was true. And he knew that this is the only means of salvation for anyone wanting to get to heaven. That's why they manifested courage and suffering, sacrifice of tenacious partners. Number two, the conviction and stewardship of trustworthy preachers. They were preachers of the word, preachers of the gospel, preachers of the truth, and preachers of this life-changing truth. And because they were preachers, the gospel had been trusted into their hands, and they were trustworthy people, dependable people. And one the Lord had given them, they kept jealously, and they passed that across to the people that heard them. The conviction and the stewardship of trustworthy preachers. Number three, the commitment and the selflessness. Not thinking about themselves, not asking for glory from anyone, and not flattering anyone because of cloak or covetousness, but just giving themselves over unto the Lord with a kind of commitment that the world never saw before their time. The commitment and the selflessness of transparent pastors. These were real pastors, and I pray that all our pastors, including myself, will be like them in Jesus' name. Number one, the courage and the suffering of tenacious partners. We're coming to chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, verses 1 and 2. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. Yourselves know that we came unto you. We came to Philippi. And then we came to you. We came to Thessalonica. And our coming was not in vain. Something happened. Something will happen to you. So that you'll be able to say the coming of the preachers. The coming of the evangelists. The coming of the pastor. To our location. To our district. And to our environment, to our community, it was not in vain. It touched me. It transformed me. It broke my heart heart. It made me to go in the direction of the kingdom and of the king. And it made me a follower of the Lord and a follower of the people of God. It made me a believer, a real believer with a change of life. Paul and Silas suffered as they were shamefully entreated at Philippi. And there was much contention surrounding the preaching of the gospel. Opposition, persecution arose as these servants of God preached the gospel, the gospel of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, in spite of that intense opposition, despite that intense opposition and persecution, they were bold to call sinners to repentance, challenging them to turn from idols and from all their sins to serve the living and the true God. He said, we were bold in our God to speak. Look at verse 2. But even after we had entered before, we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as she knew at Philippi, we were bold 
in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. He said, we are bold in our God. The question is, what makes a preacher bold? What makes a preacher of the gospel and evangelist, what makes him bold? What makes a pastor, a local pastor, or a state pastor, or a national pastor, what makes a pastor bold in declaring the word of the Lord? What makes a teacher of the word? Somebody is teaching the word, and as Sunday scripture or any other time is teaching, and then he's bold in the Lord. What makes him bold? Number one, is sure of what he's saying. He has the knowledge of the word of God. Number two, he doesn't have just have the head knowledge. He has a heart understanding, feeling, knowledge of that word. And he knows that this is true. Every jot and every teacher of the word he declares, he knows it to be true. Number three, he has experienced it. He has tasted it. And he loves it. It has worked effectually and effectively in his life. It has produced the life of Christ in him. And because of that personal experience, it makes him bold. He has the righteousness of the true believer. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 1. Proverbs chapter 28. And we're looking at verse 1. It says, the wicked flee when no man pursues. A preacher that is still wicked will not be bold. A preacher that is still sinful will not be bold. An evangelist that, has, that is running around with other people's wives will not be bold. A pastor that is committing sin, a leader that is committing sin with member of the members of the congregation will not be bold. But the righteous are as bold as what? As a lion. When there's no sin. When all the accusation of the devil against you cannot hold any water. When you know it's all false. The devil knows it's all false. And the people know it's all false. And Christ knows it's all false. And you have the righteousness of the people of God. Not just of somebody saved. But somebody who is a servant of God. Called of God. And commissioned by God. And faithful to that calling. The righteous is as bold as a lion. And that's why Paul the Apostle said, We're bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. By the way, do you know that all the other apostles stood as the kind of thing they manifested? If you're a real minister of the gospel and you know the gospel and you know Christ and you know the power of the gospel working in your life, that boldness will be there. You'll not be speaking the word of God and then the way to heaven as if you are not sure. You'll not be timid and then frightened at the sinners you are speaking to. You'll be declaring the word of God with conviction and with boldness because of the righteousness in you. And because of the assurance that you have, this is the only way. And you know that if the people are going to get to heaven, they have to take that way. You'll be talking of that convincingly. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 4 verse 13. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. We're looking at verse 13 now. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John. By the way, you remember that Peter was the one that denied the Lord. When he met said, I'm sure that you're one of them. He became afraid. He was afraid for his life. He thought he might die at that time. Because they were taking Jesus Christ to crucify him. But then, he, that, that means that he backslid actually when he denied the Lord. But then he came back and salvation was restored. And then he got into a real genuine experience of holiness, righteousness, purity, and sanctification. And then after that, were filled with the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Ghost came, conviction, power, boldness, authority came. And then it says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they, had, they were learned men and ignorant men. And they marveled that they and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. When you have been having fellowship with Jesus, communion with Jesus, that boldness will come into you. I pray it will come in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 1. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, reading from verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that. They, that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake and so spake these were people that were sure that assurance 
These were people that, that had conviction. They spoke convincingly. These were people that knew their God. And the people that do know their God will be strong and they will do exploits. These were the people that knew Christ. And they knew that they said the only Savior. No other Savior anywhere. And because of that, they so speak that a great multitude, both of Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. Look at verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Persecution came because they spoke the gospel boldly. Persecution came because they spoke the gospel convincingly. Persecution came because they lifted up the Lord Jesus Christ as the only Savior as our substitute, as our sin bearer, and as the one that has come to take all our sins away. And he invited the people, he called them to repentance. And then the people stirred up the unbelievers and then persecution arose. Did they run out of town because of that? I said, did they run away because of that? And then became like jellyfish, no backbone, no conviction again, so fearful and frightened as if they were chicken or hens that they poured water upon and then shivering as if, what are we going to do? Now look at verse 3. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord. It says, therefore, because of the persecution, Therefore, because of that pain, therefore, because of the contradiction of those sinners against them, and they were trying to hinder the people that needed to get saved because of that long time, therefore, they even planned to, maybe they planned to spend short time before they said, because of this persecution, we're going to speak until everybody is convinced that Jesus is the only way, the way that leads to life eternal. Long time, therefore, about thee speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. You know, the people who are not for real, what they'll do whenever there is persecution, they run away from town. If they are in the district and then there are some unbelievers trying to make trouble and making noise and shouting and screaming, then the, fellow, the next day fellowship, they will not come. They say, I don't know whether those hooligans are still there. I want to protect my life. Or if something broke out in a particular community, in any nation, or in any continent, then the people, either they run away from that community because they're not sure what will happen again. But Paul the apostle said, hey, stay there. If you're righteous, stay there. If you have the conviction that Christ is living within you and you know that he is the only way and you have found this way, long time therefore abode thee in a place of trouble, that place of trial, that place of persecution, and that place of opposition, speaking boldly concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people, if they go out to witness one day and then the unbelievers and the sinners and those people of the other religion, if they threaten them, then they'll never, never witness again. Oh, they said those people threatened us. And they said if you come here again, if you do this again, we're going to show you that this place is not for Christ. It's not for Christianity. Here, you're not going to be able to convert anybody. Then they become so afraid. But when you have Christ in you, and you have the Holy Ghost within you, and you have the fire of the Holy Ghost burning within you, there will be boldness in you. And I pray that before you go this day, that boldness will come to you in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 26, I'm reading from verse, 20, from verse 19. Acts chapter 26, from verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they shall repent and turn to God and do works meet suitable for repentance. Paul the apostle said King Agrippa, do you know at this time they were trying him, they were examining him and they could put him in jail or keep him in jail. They could do anything to him, but he never cared for that. His spirit was stronger than his body. 
and his spirit made him to remain bold even though the body might be weak and the body might be lacerated because of the whips even though the legs might be having pain because they put the legs in stores and they put him in prison but his spirit was strong it was courageous it was bold in the lord because he knew the lord i pray that every one of us will know the lord that way when you have repented you have turned to the lord and that gospel has worked in your life produce righteousness and boldness produce righteousness and holiness produce sanctification and produce this ticket and this passport that leads to heaven and you know that your christ come today by the grace of god because of that gracious virtue of christ in your life heaven is your home you'll speak convincingly and boldly you'll not be kind of timid and trembling for the unbelievers in fact it says in verse 21 for these causes they just caught me in the temple and went about to kill me having therefore obtained help of god i i continue on to this day witnessing both to small and to great nothing all that none, none other things than those which the prophets and moses did say shall come that jesus that christ shall suffer and that he should be the force that should rise from the dead and shall show light unto the people and to the gentiles that's boldness that even then when he was being tried even then when he knew that these people, if they found anything wrong and they didn't agree with what he said, they could throw him into jail. All that will not bother him. I pray that the same conviction and courage and boldness and strength of character will be in every one of us in Jesus' name. But you know the reason why is because they knew they were not following cunningly devised fables. They were very sure of what they declared, of what they urged, what they presented and what they were preaching unto the people in Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one, reading from verse sixteen. Verse sixteen says, "For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. The people that are following fables, stories, not having any foundation, and are following the philosophies of men that will perish when the world collapses." But they knew that this is the eternal truth. They knew this is the everlasting gospel. They knew that this is the only message that prepares a man for heaven for eternity. And because they knew they were not following cunningly devised fables, that's why it says, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That's why it says in verse 19, we have, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. They said we were sure of this. And because of the assurance they had in what they declared, that's why they could speak boldly, courageously, convincingly to the people that they were talking to. Paul and Silas gracefully endured false accusation. They endured misrepresentation. They, they endured the shame and the beating and the imprisonment. In all their suffering, that they, they kept a happy and holy attitude. They didn't become unrighteous because of suffering unholy because of suffering impure because of suffering they didn't give up and say this holiness is not working this righteousness is not working and this purity of heart and life is not working and just being very careful to follow after the lord and the character the comportment of the lord is not working because after all the holiness and the righteousness look at the persecution we're facing they knew that those who are righteous and godly and holy will suffer persecution. And therefore, they just continued and they remained steady and steadfast in a sanctified disposition and life that they had. They, this had a positive impact on the Thessalonians who heard the transforming gospel and also saw true godliness demonstrated in their midst and the lord is bringing the same challenge to us that the same thing we've seen in paul and silas and timothy the same thing we've seen in those Thessalonians. we too were going to have it i said we're going to have it many of us have it already i pray they'll have more of it in jesus name we're looking at philippians chapter 1 verse 27 philippians chapter 1 verse 27 only let your conversation 
your manner of life, your conduct, your comportment, your character. Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your fears that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. In nothing terrified by the opposition. In nothing terrified by your persecutors. In nothing terrified by the, by the blasphemers. In nothing terrified by the people that do not accept the gospel. In nothing terrified by the people that oppose you. Nothing terrified by your adversaries. That which is to them an evident token of perdition. But to you of salvation and of God, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his name's sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. In chapter 2 of Philippians, reading from verse 14. Philippians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. When you, are, when you have assurance, you'll not murmur. When you have assurance, you'll not dispute or debate. When you are convinced of what you believe, of Christ within, of the power of the gospel, of the change and the transformation that that gospel produces in you. And when you're sure that this is the way to heaven, and you're living courageously and convincingly, in that way, taking every step according to the word of the Lord. There will be no disputing. There will be no murmuring. Do all things without murmurings and disputing. When you know that the assignment you are given was only given through man, it was given by God. That almighty God himself gave this assignment. And whether men say well done or not, you know that God is saying well done. And God is happy with what you are doing. And you know that that assignment is going to be rewarded when you get there in eternity. And the Lord is going to look at your life and is going to look at your faithfulness. And you know that this is of God. He told me to do this. He told me to preach this. He told me to witness like this. He told me to witness and to win souls to the Lord. And I'm doing it because of the Lord. When you know it is of the Lord, you're not going to murmur or dispute, do all things without murmurings. And disputing, when you know that what you're doing is going to bring eternal reward, that because of what you're doing today, God is putting on record and is already uh, going to give you a crown, a reward, an award for what you're doing. And nobody is going to murmur because he's going to get a reward, he's going to get an award, he's going to get a congratulation from the Lord, he's going to get stars in his crown. Why do people murmur? They murmur because I don't know the end of this. I don't know whether this is going to be rewarded or not. I don't know whether God is looking at me or not. I don't know whether it is man that gave me the responsibility or not. I don't know what I'm doing, whether it's going to catch God's attention or not. That's why they murmur. But when they, you have conviction and assurance that every step, every literal sin, every major sin, every spiritual sin, every material sin, every physical sin is ordained of God for you to do. There will be no murmuring. You'll do everything according to the scripture. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. That she may be blameless and, and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding forth the word of life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ. That I have not run in vain nor labored in vain. I pray you'll not labor in vain. And you'll not walk in vain. And you'll not come to fellowship in vain in Jesus' name. And the assignment the Lord has given you to do, you'll not do it in vain in Jesus' name. Point number two now, the conviction and the stewardship of trustworthy preachers. The conviction and the stewardship of trustworthy preachers. Trustworthy preachers are preachers that can be trusted. A preachers that God says, I'm confident in them. I trust them. They'll say what I want them to say. They'll preach what I want them to preach. 
They will not look at faces. They will not be afraid of the rich. They will not be afraid of the kings and the queens. They will not be afraid of the highly placed. They will declare my word faithfully. They will defend this faith once delivered unto the saints. I trust them. I commission them. I give to them what they ought to do. And I know they're going to be faithful unto me. Those are trustworthy preachers. And Paul was one of them. And Silas was one of them. And Timothy was one of them. I pray that you too, you'll be one of them. Trustworthy preachers. Let's look at verses 3 and 4. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. Paul the Apostle said, the three of us that came to Thessalonica, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, our exhortation, our counseling, our encouragement, our admonition, our instruction, our message, our declaration and proclamation, it was not of deceit. We didn't deceive anybody. We didn't tell sinners, well, just bring money. And give all that you have. Then you'll be saved. We didn't deceive them. And we didn't tell the backsliders, well, God doesn't mind. God has overlooked everything. It was not of deceit. We didn't just make, pat everybody at the back. And then just say, everything will be all right eventually for everybody. There will be no judgment or day of judgment. No. Our exhortation and preaching and message was not of deceit. It was not of uncleanness. What he actually meant is that there were people that were preaching to be able to attract some women to themselves so that they'll be able to have an unlawful relationship with them. And Paul the Apostle said, but you know, our exhortation and preaching was not to entice anybody, attract anybody, or bring anybody near us. All we wanted to do was to lead them to Christ and bring them near unto Christ. And it was not of guile, deception. And then it says in verse 4, For as we were allowed, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, he gave us the gospel. And he said, I'm trusting you. Don't take away from it. Don't add unto it. Don't modify it. And don't adjust it to your hearers or to suit yourself. It says we are put in trust with the gospel. Even so, we speak. Not as pleasing men. The danger is there for preachers to please men. The danger is there for preachers to please the rich in the congregation. The highly placed in the congregation. The political elites in the congregation. And the people that have connections in the congregation. The danger is there for the preacher to be men pleasers and to be men servers. And just to dance to the tune of everybody so that maybe they'll be, able, they'll be taken care of properly. Or maybe they'll not have uh, any difficulty or any challenge. Because, you know, in any congregation, there are nice people. There are not so nice people. In any congregation, there are easygoing people. There are tough difficult people. In any congregation, there are people that just seek in the word and take in the word. In any congregation, there are resistant people, always resisting the word of God. And when you preach the word directly, face to face, confront confronting the people that have been there for a long time and they refuse to repent. Maybe they have two wives and they say, you're not going to drive me away from the church. This is my church. I'll keep on coming. Whatever you preach, I'm going to keep on coming. And if you mention any Everybody having two wives, the following meeting day, they come to sit in the front and say, hey, here am I. I heard you talking about two wives uh, last uh, time. I'm here now. You want to preach? Go ahead and preach. I'm telling you I'm here in this church forever and ever, and I'm not going to leave. And even if you preach uh, from here till eternity, I'm still going to keep my two wives. And then some preachers, they're intimidated by that. They cannot continue to say the same thing because those people say they are not going to change. But here Paul the apostle said, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but pleasing God, which tries our hearts. 
That's the kind of courageous preachers we need. If we have more, more preachers like that in this nation, people will stop being religious. They become righteous. And I pray that God will raise you up as preachers like that in Jesus' name. As we come to our Bible study tonight and we think of the people who are here, I'm thinking of what John Wesley said. John Wesley was the one that preached. Uh, he preached so many messages all over England. In fact, even those who did not agree with him, they said his preaching changed not just Methodist Church, changed the whole nation, Britain. And John Wesley at one time said, give me 100 men that fear nothing but sin. They don't fear men. They don't fear women. They don't fear the rich. They don't fear the poor. They don't fear political people. They don't fear religious people that fear nothing but sin. Hundred men. And he says, will turn the world upside down. And we're saying the same thing. That we have more than 100 men. More than 1,000. And if one of us will stay true to the word, and then we take the word that will change lives, and then you take it to every community and every place, preaching the word of God, and then you forget every other thing, and forget yourself, and you fear nothing but sin. This nation will be turned around in Jesus' name. But you know, if we who know the truth, if we are running away from where there is trouble, Running away from where there is any kind of challenge. Running away from, you know, whenever there's any trouble here, whenever there's anybody in the congregation threatening us and looking at us as if, if you say that again, we're going to persecute you more. And then we we'll become like jellyfish and then we'll run away amphibians that cannot stay either in water or land. And we don't have the boldness or the courage of the children of God to speak again. What's going to be the future of gospel preaching? I pray that all these things will change. And then we find that it was not just himself alone. The other people too. They had the same courage. The same courage and the same earnestness in preaching the word. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 1 and 2. Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Those are the kinds of people that can make a mark in this generation. The people that are perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. The people that they are not looking for your money. They are looking for your soul. They are not looking for your property. They are looking for your soul. They are not looking for what you have. They are looking for who you are to be turned unto the Lord. Not even turned unto themselves. We are looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 16. Second Corinthians chapter 12 verse 16. Be, but be it so. I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with God. Paul the apostle was saying, he discovered that the Corinthians were crafty. They had gall, they had deception. It would be unfortunate if a some in the congregation are crafty and their preacher too is crafty. Unfortunate. If the backsliders in the congregation in the church are deceptive and their preacher too is deceptive. Paul the apostle said, we walk straight and honest above board, above reproach. Holy, honest, forthright, trustworthy. But you, I caught you with guile. I caught you being crafty. Did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? I desire Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walk not we in the same spirit? Walk not we in the same steps? Paul the apostle was sure of himself, and thank God he was sure of the partners that walked along with him. I pray that we'll be sure of ourselves too. And we'll be sure of you too, walking along with us and fellowship with us in this, our church, in Jesus' name. In First Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Which was committed to my trust. It was committed to my trust. What does that mean? It, it's like when somebody is traveling. And when that person is traveling, he calls you, he says, you know, I'm traveling, I'm, you know, going in 
long distance. It will take me some time before I come back. But you are living in the community here. Here is my daughter. Please take care of her for me. I trust you. You are trustworthy. You are dependable. I can lean upon you. I can close my eyes and then travel because I know my daughter is safe in the community because of you. It will be unfortunate if such a person that the man trusted will then defile that daughter. Or if somebody said, my brother, I'm traveling. Look, at my wife is there. And, you know, as women, they'll have some needs that if I were around, I'll be able to provide them. But you are there, my brother. Please, I entrust my wife into your hand. After all, you're married yourself. It will be unfortunate a tragedy. If that man, that somebody had trusted to say, take care of my wife. And then will be fumbling with the wife, messing up with the wife. The wife herself, not keeping her dignity. And then the man... Not to be trusted. And Paul the apostle said, that's how the gospel was committed into my hand. And then the Lord trusted me. I said, take care of this. And share it. And give it to the people. And he said, I'm praying all the time. God will help me to be trustworthy and to remain faithful. And I pray that we'll be faithful like that. I'm looking at Galatians chapter 1. Pleasing God and not pleasing men. Galatians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 10. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? I want you to look at your own Christian life. I want you to look at your own Christian comportment. Do you do anything with, the, with your eyes on God, on Christ? God is watching me. God is looking at me. When the pastor does not know what I'm doing, God knows. When he doesn't know my thoughts, my mind, my feeling, my actions, my reaction, my tendencies, what I'm covering up, God knows. And because God knows and God has called me and God has given me my assignment, I'm going to be faithful to God transparently. Are you like that? Are you a person that you say, well, I just want to please the people around me. After all, the pastor that committed this to my hand, uh, if these people around me, if they oppose me or if they fight against me, the pastor will not even know and not be able to defend me. If I want to live an easy life and if I want to live a convenient life, I better know how to please these people. Those are people you cannot trust. Those are people that play and gamble with the gospel. Those are people that do not have conviction that every judge and every teacher in the word of God is necessary. You see, you can throw up that and still have a little remaining. You can throw up that and have a little remaining. They are not trustworthy. The people who are trustworthy are the people that gird jealously the totality of the word of God, the whole counsel of God. And they say, whatever happens, whatever people do, whatever people say, whether people understand or misunderstand me, I'm going to keep to this word because every jot of it, every title of it, every little part of it is very important. They are not trying to please men, they are pleasing God. That's why Paul, the apostle said in chapter 1 of Galatians verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God or do I seek to please men for if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. If I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. If I'm so much afraid of my life, I need some ease. I need some convenience. I want the smiles of the people. I want the commendation of the people. More than the commendation of God. He said, I cannot be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're reading verses 1 and 2. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us 
all how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. Amen. Amen. Paul the Apostle said, I've been faithful. I'm trustworthy. I've given the word to you exactly as the Lord gave me. And as he wants me to give unto you, I now throw it to you that you are the one now to be faithful and to please God. We are pleasing the Lord in every area of the ministry. You are now to please the Lord in every area of your life and comportment. We're thinking about uh, these unfaithful um, people, these ungodly people. You know why they do what they do? They're looking for some ease and convenience, commendation and honor from men. And the Bible says about them in First John chapter 4, verse 5. First John chapter 4, verse 5. They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world heareth them. That's all they want to do. They're not thinking about God. They're not thinking about the judgment day. They're not thinking about the rapture. They're not thinking about the reward we're going to have. They're not thinking about pleasing the Lord. All they're thinking about is the world. They are the world. Therefore, speak they of the world. Whatever they're doing, they're not saying, what does God think about this? No. What does Christ think about it? No. What will my hearers think about this? What will my friends think about this? What will the majority of the people in the church think about this? What will those people that want to remain in their seats, what do they think about this? Will I be popular with them? They're looking for popularity. They're not looking for pleasing the Lord. And it says they are of the world. Therefore, they speak of the world. And the world hears them. I pray that none of us in this church will be like that. Did I hear your amen? amen. We're looking at um, we're looking at Psalm 17, verse 14. These people, the world in them, their portion is in the world. Psalm 17, I'm looking at verse 14. 17, verse 14. From men which are thy hand, O Lord, from men, for men of the world which have their portion in this life. Those are the people, they please the world, they think of the world, they talk of the world, and all they do is just so that the world will praise them. Their portion is in this life. But faithful men, trustworthy preachers are different. They know that they have been put in trust with the gospel. And they are conscious of God who knows all hearts and constantly tries our hearts. Because of this, the exhortation was not of deceit. It was not of uncleanness. It was not in guile. Both their message and their manner of life were kept pure and clean, free from deceit and free from defilement. The gospel came from the pure and the holy God. It was preached faithfully by pure and holy ministers and it produced transparent purity and holiness in members of the church. Our preachers are giving us the word. Our overseers are giving us the word. Our teachers are giving us the word. The pure, unadulterated gospel of the Lord. I pray that the same result it produced in these Thessalonians, it will produce in every one of us. Saved, separated from the world, sanctified, purified, made holy, waiting expectantly for the coming of the Lord so they can be ready and so they can be rapturable. We're coming to the third point now. Third point, the commitment and selflessness of transparent pastors. The commitment and selflessness of transparent pastors. To be transparent means you can see through like glass. Like the glass, we say the glass is transparent. You're on this side and the glass is there. And then you can see the other side. Nothing covered. The glass doesn't hide anything from you. It is transparent. And there are preachers like that. Transparent. We know their lives. That's why you're able to sometimes even mimic them. Mock them. Because you know everything you, they do. You know they're going out and they're coming in. They have no secret. Their lives are open. Their lives are transparent. 
And you know, even their timetable, when they wake up and when they sleep and when they eat and when they do anything, you know where they go? Some preachers like that, they're transparent. There's nothing done in secret. And that's what God wants every believer to be. That you as a wife, your husband will know that you are transparent and can see through. There's no secret letter, secret telephone call, and secret text, and secret whatever that your husband does not know about. Transparent. Husband. That's how God wants you to be. Transparent. It's not only for the pastor. Not only for the minister. Not only for the Christian worker. Transparent husbands. That your wife can take your phone, scroll through, and then see all the texts and see all the things that are coming in there. After all, she's your wife. Children, youths, transparent, born again, saved. Your life is clear. Your life is open. There is nothing hidden in the portmanteau in the box that daddy and mommy cannot see. Should not see. Nothing in the phone. Nothing on the computer. And there is no email that they are carrying about. I hope they have not seen that. Transparent. Workers in the church and leaders in the church. That we're not hiding behind the curtain or closed door. But you are transparent. But if a pastor is not transparent, his people cannot be transparent. If a leader is not transparent, those who are following cannot be transparent. If those who are preaching, if they are not transparent, the people who are listening to them, they say, well, the pastor is doing hide and seek. Our ministers and preachers are doing hide and seek. We better do hide and seek also. Hypocrisy will be prevalent in the church. Transparent pastors, transparent people, transparent ministers, transparent ministers and members, transparent parents and transparent children, transparent husbands, transparent wives, transparent neighbors, transparent everyone. And that's the way we're going to keep on living because of the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. And because of the greatness of the power of the Lord working in our lives. I pray that if you have not been like that this night, you'll turn around. It will be like that in Jesus' name. Transparent children of God. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. For neither at any time. Think about those words. At any time. That's righteousness. At any time. That's consistent Christian living. At any time. That's persevering to the very end. At any time. You know the people that are not saying, well, maybe I can backslide now and then I will repent later. I can do this now. God is a loving God. He will forgive me later. No, not at any time. Just faithful to the Lord. Just trustworthy. Just holy. Just righteous. Just pure. Just dependable. Just transparent. For neither at any time used we flattering words. As she know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory. Nor of men sought we glory. Nor of men, of women of course, of children sought we glory. There are people that are too self-conscious. All they're seeking for, they're seeking for praise. They're seeking for applause. They're seeking for the commendations of men. They're seeking for glory from men. And because of that, you cannot please the Lord. Because you're saying, will they praise me for this? Will they appreciate me for this? Will they congratulate me for this? Will they give me a reward for this? Will they say well done for this? It says, nor of me such with glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. What he meant by being burdensome is that so that they'll be able to have the financial support, material support, there are some pastors that, you know, because, uh, you know, the members support, it's good for the members to support their pastor. They have to. They have to. But there are some preachers that just because of that support, I <laughs> should be careful now because they might decrease his salary. 
The council can meet together. The committee can meet together and then decrease their salary because of ladies and preaching holiness and sanctification and purity and not giving bribe and not doing this and not doing that. And because of that, we're not happy with him. We're going to show him that he ought to change. Otherwise, you know, if, we, if you increase his salary, he'll be encouraged and keep on preaching like he's preaching. Therefore, because they're afraid, you might lessen what comes to them. Therefore, they are seeking the praise of men. They are seeking recommendation from them. But Paul, the apostle, said, not we. And I pray that in this church, it will never, never come to that situation where our leaders and coordinators and group coordinators and regional overseers and, reg and state overseers and local pastors will be seeking the praise of their congregation in Jesus' name. Tell us the truth. Show us the way, the way of repentance the way of righteousness. We want to get to heaven. Life does not end here. Tell us everything. Don't close your mouth and don't speak uh, out of the two corners of your mouth. Be straightforward. Tell us what will get us to heaven. Whether we like it today or not, tell us in the future when we get to heaven we'll be grateful that you told us the truth. We're thinking about the future. And so don't be among those preachers that just cajole and kind of deceive their people because they're looking for recommendation. Motives matter in the mind of the master. Preaching the gospel or laboring in the ministry tirelessly is not enough. God must be a witness that we do it without seeking the honor coming from men. God must be a witness that we're doing what we're doing without seeking great things for ourselves. God must be a witness that we're doing what we're doing without trying to make a name for ourselves. God must be a witness that we're doing it without having men's persons in admiration because of personal advantage. He must be a witness that we're doing it without our hearts changed and soiled with covetousness. That without, we're doing it without flattery without using flattery, in order to gain of the congregation. We're doing what we're doing without seeking glory, praise, applause, approval, or awards from the church or from the world. God is witness. Can you call God to witness like that? That we're living for Christ? That we're serving God only for the salvation of souls and for the glory of God? Is God witness that in all things, at all times, at any time and every time, you speak and serve without any cloak or pretext or motives of concealed covetousness or righteous gain? The Lord wants us to examine ourselves. And he wants the Lord, he wants us to give the Lord chance to examine our hearts as well. That the Lord himself will examine us. And then when he says, well done, you've done everything according to the way I want it done. And that you have been entrusted with the gospel and you're trustworthy. Only then will you be able to have joy. Let's look at Second Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. It says, examine yourself. Check up your heart. Check up your life. How are you living? And with what understanding, co conviction, are you living Let's look at Psalm 26. Psalm 26, not only that you examine yourself, you're even telling the Lord, oh Lord, examine me, examine me. And see if everything is all right. I don't want to labor in vain. I don't want to come to this world and then come to the church and be in the kingdom and come to the Bible study and serve you and profess salvation and profess a brother. And yet I'm just false. I don't want that. Lord, examine me. Psalm 26 verse 2. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins on my heart. Look at Psalm 139, Psalm 139, that the Lord will check your motive, check your heart, check your character, check what you do in the private, check what you do in the public. We're looking at Psalm 139, and we're looking at verse 23. Search me, O God, 
and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, Lord. Look at my heart. Look at my experience. Check up on my testimony. Check up on the life I live. Check up on all this proclamation, pronouncement, going about. I'm saved. I'm sanctified. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm serving the Lord. I'm faithful. I'm dependable. I'm trustworthy. All these great, grand testimonies we give in our fellowship. I'm this. I'm that. I know the Lord. I read the Bible. I'm following the Lord. I'm faithful to the Lord. I read the Bible through every year. And I'm very deep, deeper than deep. Search me, O oh God. And know my heart. Try me. And know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. We're looking at Job. Looking at Job chapter 34. Job chapter 34. I'm reading from verse 31 and verse 32. Surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have born chastisement. I will not offend any more. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. That's still saying, Lord, search me. Lord, examine me. If there's anything I'm, I'm overlooking, if there's anything I'm forgetting, if there's anything I'm glossing over, if there's anything I'm covering up, if, if there's anything I'm hiding, Lord, search me. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. When you are sincere like that and you come before the Lord, and then you tell the Lord to cleanse you, wash you, purge you, and purify you. Make your life holy. Make your life transparent. That's how the Lord will have mercy. Proverbs chapter 28. I'm reading from verse 13. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. He that will just cover it up. No salvation, but will cover it up. There's backsliding, but we'll cover it up. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsaketh them shall have, shall have, I pray we'll have mercy. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. What's the use trying to serve the Lord? Giving so much of your time, so much of your treasures, so much of your money, so much of what you have unto the Lord. And yet, you're covering up sin. And when the trumpet shall sound, you'll be missing eternity. What's the use? Why are you not faithful to yourself just this one time and say, Lord, I want something real. He that confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Mercy is waiting for us. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I need that mercy. I need that mercy. Forget the praise of men. Forget the honor that comes from man only. Forget their congratulation, their celebration. Forget the praise, the honor, the glory, the flattery. Many of the praises the people give us, it's all flattery. Expose yourself before the Lord. If you conceal it, the Lord will expose you later. But if you expose yourself before the Lord, then the Lord will cover it up with the blood of Jesus and will cleanse you and purge you, purify you, give you a life without blame, without reproach, 
without sin, sinning. The salvation through the blood of the Lamb. The cleansing through the blood of the Lamb. That's how we even came into this world. And if you have every other thing in the world, but you don't have salvation, you'll be of all men the most miserable when the bell rings eventually to come on home. If all the people in the church are praising you, exalting you, congratulating you, speaking well of you, even make, making you an example to other people. Look at so and so. Look at so and so. He's so dedicated. She's so dedicated. Everybody pressing you. But as a fight goes, the life of the true believer is not there. Righteousness, honesty, sincerity, purity, holiness is not there. Everybody praising you except your wife. Who knows your hypocrisy at home? Everybody praising you except your husband. Who knows how hard and harsh and terrible you are? Everybody praising you except your parents. Who knows about your inner life? In the inner chamber, everybody pressing you except the full time workers in the church who are very, very close to you. And they know the rottenness of your life. They are concerned and praying for you. Let's forget the praise of men. The commendation of men. Let's for this once throw away this habit of seeking the applause of men and lay yourself bare and open before the Lord. And be conscious of God, not conscious of men. Or conscious of women. My praise is nothing if God doesn't praise you. My flattery is nothing if God does not know that you are truly righteous. My appreciation, my honor, my commendation means nothing if you are not living a transparent life before the Lord. Real salvation that we have. We're not trying to keep up an image. Because of anybody, this just between us and the Lord. You are not in church because of anybody between you and the Lord. You are not trying to walk straight because of anybody, but be just because of the Lord. He knows you and sees you through and through. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my life. See if there be any wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin. Make me pure. He can do it. What can wash away my sin? Nothing. 
for the blood of Jesus. Who can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If we walk in the light, I see is in the light. We have fellowship with him. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Become trustworthy. And transparent, truthful, show that grace brings transformation. Show that the blood of Jesus washes whiter than snow. Let your experience attest to the fact that when Christ comes in, he makes us new, renewed creatures. Still ever the same? He did it for the Thessalonian believers. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. What he did for them he still doing today for everyone that sincerely honestly believes in Christ holiness is not the work of man it's not by struggling it's a gift of God and God has not changed still cleanses today God has not changed Purifies the heart today as of old. God has not changed. Still makes us transparently righteous, pure, and holy today. As it did in the good old days. He has not changed. Christ Jesus has the power. Allow him to do it. Give him chance to work in your life. And this transforming gospel will work effectually and effectively. Your heart and your life. Give me a righteous life and making you to live a rapturable, a worthy life.